and thank you to the organizers for putting together this workshop uh, conference allowing me to talk also um, yes so I'm going to talk about the Poisson Voronei tessellation and I'll start by making sure all those words make sense uh, <laughs> and actually I would like to add a, an open problem to the problem session I'll play by the rules and it'll take 30 seconds so, and I'll do it at the end if that's okay uh, okay it's also not related to what I'm talking about so. <laughs> Okay, so this is the, this is, okay, there we go, the hyperbolic space. So this is the hyperbolic plane, a model of the hyperbolic plane. So everything I'm going to do today in detail will be about the hyperbolic plane. Some of the theorems that I will talk about also work in d-dimensional hyperbolic space. So what you're looking at is a uniform tiling of the hyperbolic plane, really spectacular object. Uh, so each of those triangles, uh, well, they're isometric. You can use the isometries of the hyperbolic plane to map them transitively between each other. Um, <clears throat> I put it up here to illustrate two features of the geometry of hyperbolic space. Uh, one is that uh, volume growth is exponential, so you can sort of count triangles. Oh, I have a pointer. Yeah, if you go out some, uh, some fixed distance, you can sort of see a branching structure. Okay, so you're getting a, a growth, an exponential growth in the number of triangles. Those all have the same volume. It's exponential volume growth. The second thing is that, uh, is that uh, geodesics are diverging exponentially. So, so this is not an invariant tiling. Is it not an invariant no, tiling? Because the degree in the middle is different from the degree. I never actually counted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, well, there is, a, there is an invariant tiling. This is not it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I've given this talk many times, too, with that picture. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so it's, uh, maybe there's some periodicity. I guess there are some, some yeah, okay. Oops. Uh, okay, proceeding. Uh, <laughs> uh, so so uh, exponentials, uh, geodesics diverge exponentially. So if you, if you follow some uh, geodesic out from the origin, follow another geodesic out from the origin, and I tell you, you have to connect those two points without going through the center. So going around a Euclidean ball or something like that. Well, then you'd have to go around the outside like this, and the distance is exponential in, in the radius. Uh, for this reason, it's usually said or often said that the, that the hyperbolic space is tree-like because the, the best way to go, the geodesic between these two points, comes back in through the center and then goes back out. Okay, um, this is also an example of, uh, of a, a Voronoi tessellation, I believe. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll make something precise in a second, but yeah. Oops. Uh, so... A Voronoi tessellation or tiling is it's a very general construction. You can do it in basically any metric space. Uh, what you do is you take a collection of points. It should be discrete. Um, usually you do this in a proper metric space also. I guess you don't have to, but... Uh, and then you form the Voronoi cells with nuclei at those points. Um, so... So... What does it mean? It means you take the collection of the space, which is closer to a given point than any other point. This becomes the Voronoi cell with nucleus at that point, and this will partition the space into cells. Okay, so assuming everything is correct, this is a hand-drawn picture. <laughs> uh, what I would believe the, Voronoi, uh, the points would be to make this a Voronoi cell, uh, to make it a Voronoi tessellation. Uh, you'll notice little tiny blue specks those are artifacts of how I drew it. The big blue specks are the cells. So there's some paint that fell off. <laughs> okay. Uh, another concept I'd like to introduce is, is, uh, is a lattice. So 
I want to ultimately talk about a random object which I want to try to consider as something like a statistical lattice. So I need to give at least some definition of what a lattice should be in this context. And well, I want it to be a Voronoi tiling where the, the, the isometries, uh, there, there is a subgroup of the isometry group which acts transitively on that collection of points. Okay? And the other concept which should, uh, which should occur for a lattice is that the cells should be finite. So the Voronoi cells have finite volume. You could also require them to be, in fact, compact. would be another way to do it. Um, so also, at the end of the day, I'm really going to be interested in graphs. So to a tiling, you can associate an adjacency graph. Uh, which uh, so so two cells will be adjacent, if and only if they overlap on a co-dimension one face. Okay. Uh, also, for, for if you're familiar, this is this is also the uh, the Delaunay graph associated to the collection of points. Okay. So <clears throat> there is a sense uh, coming from geometric group theory in which a lattice is in a sense equivalent to a space. Meaning, so this is, you really need to use a different definition of lattice than I gave, but if you have a property of a, of a space, of, of a unimodular Lie group, um, uh, then you can find an analogous property of a lattice which copies that property. So for example, amenability, uh, the space will be amenable if and only if the lattice is amenable, and properties like this. Uh, so you have to you know, slightly alter the definitions for them to make sense, um, so, so, for example, the hyperbolic plane is non-amenable. So what's written there, you, you have to look at uh, smooth, smooth subdomains of H. You look at the, the boundary uh, surface volume, so this is dV here, uh, divide by the volume of V, and you take the infimum over uh, V, which, are, which have finite volume, then this will be positive. And then, then, then there's the graph notion of amenability or non-amenability, uh, which you would ask about the lattice, which would be that, uh, okay, so now you look at uh, a graph boundary, so I'll use the edge boundary. Um, so this is the number of edges crossing from V to its complement divided by the size of V, or in fact the volume of V, but it won't matter in this situation. This should be positive. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a statistical lattice, and that's going to be the hyperbolic Poisson Voronoi tessellation. And the question is does it copy the same properties? So if you take non amenability from the space, does the hyperbolic Poisson Voronoi tessellation also have non amenability? Um, I won't try to define exactly what a statistical lattice should be. This is, this is something I would like to do. Like, it's a great. Great idea, but uh, uh, there's still some work to do to see exactly what it should be to 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 be a good good definition. So, um, at the very least, this should be one. So, the definition is just that you're going to build the Voronoi tessellation, and you're going to build it with nuclei which come from a homogeneous Poisson process. So, an intensity, uh, the intensity of the process is uh, is an invariant measure on the manifold. Okay, so just for notation, I'll write this V lambda to be the dual graph of, uh, of this tessellation. That's the Delaunay graph. Okay, so I'll start with a picture. This is a simulation of, uh, of both of these objects. So the blue vertices are the Poisson points. There is a point at the origin, and I will, in general, condition the Poisson process to have a point at a given point in the space. This is eventually to make things unimodular. Um, and the, the red cells are the Voronoi cells. Um, R here is, is just a truncation parameter for how much of the, uh, the Poincare disk I actually simulated. Um, 
And for the most part, I won't talk about the difference in lambda. Lambda was the multiple of, of the hyperbolic area measure you took. You can see one difference in the simulation. Um, so as you increase lambda, you're putting in more points, which you know, causes the mean spacing to go, to go down, which means that more and more the, uh, the process looks Euclidean. And you could certainly prove that as you took lambda to infinity, this would converge, in a sense, to a Euclidean Voronoi tessellation. Um, oops. So here is lambda equals 1. So one thing you could keep track of would be, for example, uh, average degree in some sense. So the average degree of the blue graph should converge to 6, which is what it has to be for an infinite Euclidean uh, tessellation, a triangulation. Okay. Um, so, some basic properties of this object. Uh, for starters, every cell is finite. In fact, you can say much more than that. It's easy to get a tail bound on how big they should be. Um, if you look at the Voronoi cell nucleus at the origin, for example, uh, you can see that the probability that it exceeds some ball of radius t is decaying, in fact, doubly exponentially. Why should it be doubly exponentially? Well, it's pretty easy to see. Um, if you take uh, a point in your Voronoi process, this is my, I guess I can use chalk. Uh, you have a point, this is in pi lambda, it's in a big cell. So there's a point which is very far away. This is T. So it's very far away. That means that there's no other point in pi lambda which is closer to this point than this nucleus. So I can draw the disk around that point, and there must be no pi lambda inside that disk. So there has to be a big empty disk. If there's a big empty disk, well, the probability of that particular event happening decays like e to the minus lambda times the volume, which is growing exponentially, so e to the minus lambda e to the t. Okay, and so now you can do a net argument to turn this into a, to an actual statement about. Exponential, but the probability of that is e to the minus e to the t. It's doubly exponential. Okay, another basic property is that the volume growth of, uh, the vo of, this, of this graph is exponential. This, this seems totally obvious, and it's extremely annoying to prove. I don't know an easy proof of it. If you do, I'd love to hear it. Um, the only way I know to prove it is to actually compare distances. So to take the, the, the ball in the Voronoi graph, or in the Delaunay graph, and show that it embeds into a ball in the hyperbolic plane of the uh, same order of magnitude distance, same order of magnitude radius. So this is a relatively complicated argument. And then once you have that, it's, it's easy. But Ah, yeah. So this is the, the ball in the, in the adjacency graph around zero of radius, di graph distance r. Um, second point is that this is a randomly rooted lo limit of, of finite random graphs. Um, so, I, I mean, this is, this is like the benjamini schramm sense, right? So you're, you're take a, do you have a sequence of finite graphs so that when you root it randomly, choose a, a root uniformly at random, you get convergence and distribution to, uh, to the, the Poisson Voronoi, the hyperbolic Poisson Voronoi. So, so this is a, in, in contrast to the first thing, very easy to prove once you know what to do, uh, but maybe more surprising. So you, you can't just take a large truncation of the graph and choose a point uniformly at random, because as with you know, what's seen with the canopy tree, you'll end up very close to the boundary. Instead, what you can do uh, is you, you know that there exists manifolds, hyperbolic manifolds, which on any ball 
look like hyperbolic space. In fact, you can get the injectivity radius uh, to be going to infinity as a sequence of manifolds goes to infinity. So on any ball of a big size, it's exactly isometric to hyperbolic space. But it's a finite, compact manifold. So it, it's actually a, a locally hyperbolic space. It's hyperbolic space. It's quotiented by something. So you, you just put the poisson Voronoi construction on that. But on big balls, it's hyperbolic space. So it doesn't matter which one you choose. It'll look like hyperbolic space on big balls. So as you go down this sequence of random graphs, you converge to this thing. Um, a last property, I'll, I'll define this later, but uh, this is a unimodular random graph. Um, so I'll give a definition if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and I'll just say that all of these properties hold in much bigger generality. So you can do everything I just said, and it's all the same working on a, a Riemannian symmetric space. It's kind of a natural closure of where these ideas work. You can run the poisson voronoi construction. Everything I just said, well, okay, Riemannian symmetric space of non-compact type, so but it's certainly all the hyperbolic spaces. Which one? That's true, too, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, so. so just like the error in the first slide there, this, this slide is frustrating uh, because I wanted to pose the question first, is it not amenable? And then I could talk about it first. The answer is no, uh, it's not not amenable because there's a kind of obvious problem that's going to happen. It's because you build this from a Poisson process on a locally Euclidean object. So you're going to have regions where there's kind of a dense collection of points, but in that region it looks Euclidean. Okay, so it's basically Euclidean Voronoi tessellation in there, and it's not going to do better than Euclidean isoperimetry in this ball. And Euclidean isoperimetry, okay, it's not, you don't have a bounded gap, right? It's going to go to zero. And you're going to get bigger and bigger collections of these uh, locally Euclidean areas. So this destroys the, the uniform non-amenability of the object. Um, there is a way, uh, one way to, uh, to, to, to still prove something, um, which is to introduce this idea of an anchored isoparametric uh, constant. So what's going on here? So in the original isoparametric constant that was an infimum over all finite sets, this will be a restriction of the collection of sets. First, you'll pick a designated anchor. So this is the root. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. Um, it doesn't matter which one you pick. Uh, you, you compute the same ratio. So the, the size of the edge boundary divided by the volume of the set. So volume of a set in a graph will be the sum of degrees of the set. In the, the earlier case, it didn't matter since it was a transitive graph. Here it matters. Uh, and the second restriction is that you look at sets which are connected in the graph. Um, and you say that a graph has anchored expansion, positive anchored expansion, if, uh, if this is positive. And this you can show. So uh, for, I mean, for D equals 2, this was a joint work with uh, Itai Benjamini and, and Josh Pfeffer. And the proof, this is what I'll talk most about, D equals 2. Later, with, uh, with Joachim Krauss, um, found us a different proof, which is much more geometric in nature. So I'm going to share the more probabilistic proof with you today. Um, unfortunately, oh, by the way, it says 15 plus. So this is a situation where the plus was needed, I guess. It's 16 plus now, hopefully just 16. Uh, <laughs> I would like to remove this condition about lambda being sufficiently large. I don't think it's necessary, but at the moment, the proof only works for lambda sufficiently large. OK, so I, w I would like to share a little bit of how to prove this. Um, it feels like it, 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 it makes the isoparametry worse. It makes it more 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Lambda is supposed to exactly. Uh, the, the technical problem is also that if you think of it like a percolation problem, you get bigger and bigger wide open spaces when lambda goes to zero, it goes the other way. Even though the isoprometry is supposed to get better. So you have less control, it looks more wild, the, the shape that you get. But I think it's just a technical problem, so yeah. For, for more general spaces. For an amenable space, it should be amenable, right? Uh, I would say, I think so. Not, okay, maybe you should be careful, but I'm pretty sure. No. Um, I do want to discuss a few consequences of anchored expansion. So it's not as strong as expansion, but uh, it still has some nice properties. So it's a theorem of bounding that that uh, if you have a graph with bounded degree and positive anchored expansion, it's actually more general than this. But certainly, if you have a graph of bounded degree and uh, and a positive anchored expansion, then your simple random walk is ballistic in the sense of positive limit of speed. Um, you can also, he also estimated the, the heat, heat kernel. And you get this type of estimate that the, the transition probabilities decay like this stretched exponential. And this end of the one third is, is optimal in the sense that, uh, for example, for Galton Watson trees, which will have positive anchored expansion, uh, this is the correct, the correct decay. Uh, and I would like also to mention, I think what I think Ballard was referring to, right, which is that uh, one of the hallmark properties of uh, anchored expansion is that it has a type of perturbation stability in this sense. You take a graph with anchored expansion, you run Bernoulli bond percolation on it with sufficiently high constant uh, with, you know, it's not quantitative, I, I don't think, but you, maybe it is, I don't know. If, if you take uh, P sufficiently close to one, though, you will still have anchored expansion for the, for the uh, infinite clusters. Okay. Um, by the way, I would like to apply one of these conditions, at least, to the graph in question. You'll notice that this has the criterion of bounded degree. The graph I described does not have bounded degree. Um, in this case, it will not be a problem, but uh, how do we get around it? I mean, so we'll still be able to conclude ballasticity in the end. How do we get around it? So this is an example of a stationary random graph. So I'll, I'll talk about stationary random graphs and, and uh, reversible random graphs instead of unimodular random graphs, but there's a correspondence which I'll describe. So a random graph, a rooted random graph, is stationary if when you run random walk started at the root row uh, and look at the re-rooted random graph as an equivalence class of graphs, it has the same distribution as the original graph. Um, a slightly stronger criterion is that uh, the graph is reversible if you can actually do a, a bi-rooted equivalence. So you look at the root and the first step of random walk, and as a bi-rooted random graph, it's the same in distribution as reversing them. And I'll give you some examples. Um, but before that, let me just say that reversibility is basically the same as unimodularity if you're allowing yourself to slightly change the measure. So if you take a... A, a reversible random graph, and you define a new measure which is absolutely continuous but biased by the degree of the root, 
then, well, I mean, you need to work in the situation where your root has expected degree. But then, uh, P is unimodular. P is unimodular if or only if, yeah, Q is reversible. Oops, okay. Um, so some quick, quick examples. Transitive graph will give you a stationary random graph. Kind of a cheap example, there's no, no randomness, but um, the same, same flavor, a, a Cayley graph will give you a reversible random graph. For at least one random example, we've had the unimodular random tree defined a few times, so it's unimodular. Uh, a, another version of the same thing is the augmented Galton-Watson tree, which is, uh, you can define as taking a Galton-Watson tree and then attaching an independent, identically distributed Galton-Watson tree to the root going up. Uh, this is the gal augmented Galton-Watson tree. Uh, and this will be a reversible random graph. Um, the whole point of, of introducing this is that you can, uh, you can apply some ergodic theory. So you have a, a stationary sequence of random variables. Um, so for example, the speed will exist in a stationary random graph. You don't have to take limit, for example, of, of random walk. Uh, I'm not saying that it's deterministic here. You need some ergodicity for that also. Um, you also have statements about uh, the Poisson boundary and harmonic functions. So, um, so under some extra assumptions, namely that you're, you're working with graphs of exponential growth, um, positive speed is equivalent to the existence of non-constant bounded harmonic functions, which is a theorem uh, which is well known for, for, for groups. Uh, for, for speed, and anchored expansion, at least you can show this. So this is, this is actually pretty easy to show. There's not much going on here. Um, but if you take a stationary random graph, which has positive anchored expansion, um, and you need to assume, we need to assume, uh, exponential growth, then you conclude that, in fact, uh, you, the, oops, the, the random walk is ballistic and the speed is positive. So this, can, this assumption on, on having uh, exponential growth of balls, we need it for, for how we prove it, because we're going to say something about spectral gap. Um, and you want exponential growth, so you do a cheap union bound. Um, I don't see why it's necessary in the end. It seems, I mean, maybe naively that uh, if you have more growth, you should have more ways to escape. The only example, however, I know of a super exponential unimodular random graph is in fact recurrent. Uh, coming from the, from, from the fact that you have lots of growth, so your balls are growing super exponentially, but all the extra stuff you're adding is all traps. So you're just adding all these dead ends. So this slows things down a lot. Okay, it also doesn't have anchored expansion, so. It's a tree, a funny tree. Um, uh, we have no assumption on degrees. I mean, but there's, okay, but the, the balls grow exponentially, so. At least exponentially for us, an exponential expansion, right? You suppose it's because they don't go faster. Yeah, they don't go faster than exponential, right. Okay. So with that, I would like to turn to, to showing you how to prove a, uh, one way to prove anchored expansion. Um, I'm going to start with a proof for, for the lattice, which is, which is very simple, and I w want to introduce it because it's what we want to modify for our situation. Um, so the starting, uh, starting point is this, this inequality of Benjaminian Eldan. A very nice uh, statement. If you take any finite set in the hyperbolic plane, 
and you look at its convex hull. So convexity in, in hyperbolic space works almost identically to convexity in, in, uh, in R, RD. In fact, you can kind of map the theorems onto each other, uh, direct correspondence. Uh, but for a definition, a convex hull is just but smallest convex set containing the points. Convex means geodesically convex. You can connect any two points along a geodesic staying within the set. Um, and you can estimate its volume uh, linearly in the number of points that you pick. You should think of this in terms of something like gauss bonnet I mean, you take a triangle, it's got three points. Regardless, the area is always bounded. Say again? Uh, I don't know if that constant is sharp. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely in two dimensions, this is, this is a good way to do it. Yeah, so, so two dimensions, this is <laughs> a very good point. This is not, there's not much to say, because you're talking about a polygon. You can turn it into a collection of triangles. You just count the triangles, and you have the right number. Um, uh, th this, this theorem also holds for HD. The constant is different, d-dependent, and then it's, uh, there's more to it. But, uh, uh, okay. So how can we use this? So, in fact, we'll, we'll be able to prove expansion here, not anchored expansion, since we're talking about a lattice. You take a, a finite set of nuclei from your lattice. It takes them at any points. And we would like to talk about the boundary, so we're going to enlarge this set. We'll look at the one neighborhood, so we're going to put all the balls of graph distance one around them, so this will be x prime. Um, to capture the, the edge boundary, what we'll do, we'll look at the convex hull of X prime and look at the points of X prime which lie on the convex hull, the boundary of the convex hull. So these are certainly going to be points which are in the vertex boundary. So this is a lower bound for the vertex boundary of X. Um, we apply the theorem, the lemma, and so we can bound this quantity below by the volume of that object, the convex hole of that object. Okay, so what did I do? I took a convex hole, I took its boundary, I took its convex hole. This is doing nothing. Uh, so that's the same as putting the convex hole there. So it's the volume of the convex hole of X prime. Uh, and here you have uh, well, what was there before was a lower bound for the edge boundary, or vertex boundary, so it's a lower bound for the edge boundary. Okay, so far so good. Now we want to lower bound this quantity. So what we'll do is we'll count the number of Delaunay triangles contained in that set X prime. So, so these are the triangles with vertices completely contained in X prime. Now each of those triangles, because we're in a situation where, you know, uh, the, the, the Delaunay graph, I mean, you have a transitive action on it. The, the, the triangles have a uniform lower bound. So you can bound globally over the whole, whole set of triangles, some constant for the lower bound of the volume, so it turns into a counting problem how many triangles you have. But this is two-dimensional space, so you can estimate below the number of triangles you had just a triangulated region of a, a two-dimensional space uh, by, uh, by the number of vertices. So you end up with, with that. So you end up with, uh, with actual isoperimetry. This also suggests one way to approach actually proving anchored expansion. So in the, in the random case, we won't be able to expect to get a uniform lower bound for the areas of the triangles. But if we can get a bound, some kind of bound, lower bound for areas of triangles, we can get some kind of statement. So what we'll show is uh, if you take a collection of Delaunay triangles, so you, you have an anchoring point now, the origin, and you look at triangles which are connected face by face, and, and
you want to uh, bound below the, the sum of the volumes of this. This would be enough. So if we can show a theorem like this, we're going to get anchored expansion by the argument just shown. OK. So what's, how do you show something like this? So to start, I'm going to try to do the, the cheapest thing possible, which is just a terrible, terrible union bound. So these are points in a Poisson process. Uh, I have k of them. So let's say they ended up in some ball of radius r or constant times k in, in the hyperbolic plane. So I look in a ball of radius constant times k around the origin. And there's you know, uniformly chosen points in there. What if I just build triangles any way possible? Just put down one triangle with the with first with, you know, three points, and then choose another point and connect it, and choose another point and connect it, with no respect to planarity or anything, and just start summing the volumes. At the very least, if this works, this problem is trivial. So let's see. Uh, what goes on, so, so formally I'll let x1 equal to 0, and I start choosing points, x2, x3, x4, which are iid chosen from a ball of radius r. Um, I let uh, this be the area of the hyperbolic triangle formed by xyz, delta. And then I ask, what is the probability if I sum those areas, triangle, x1, x2, x3, x2, x3, x4, etc. sum them up, what is the probability that is much less than k, less than epsilon k? What's not so hard to show is that you can stochastically dominate this by essentially uniform variables. Um, because you have some line along which xi, xi plus 1 are, and then you throw in another point, and you can con lower bound the volume by by sort of controlling where it lands. And at least we'll have some smooth density, so you can lower bound it by a uniform, roughly speaking. If you do that, you get this kind of estimate. It's epsilon to the k. So is that good for anything? Well, in the end, you wanted to take a union bound now over all the ways to do this in a ball of radius r. We didn't say what r was, but naively, we have k triangles, they could reach distance k. So it's a ball of radius order k. How many points are there? Well, e to the k. How many ways are there to choose k subsets of it? e to the k, choose k, well, it's getting very big now. So it's like e to the k squared. So this is going to give really nothing, because you need, uh, you need this thing to beat e to the k squared. Now, on the other hand, we didn't really use any properties of the Delaunay triangulation. So what we'll do is we'll use one critical property, which is this. So one way to define the Delaunay uh, triangulation is that three points are a triangle if and only if the, the circumdisc, so in Euclidean space, it makes sense, right? You can take three points, as long as they're not on a line, you can find a a disk, and with that, it was those three points on the boundary. So you need to be able to do that in hyperbolic space too, in order to make this a Delaunay triangle. And, but you should ask if this is always possible, and the answer is no. So you can definitely find three points in hyperbolic space, which are not collinear, which do not have a circumdisc. Um, I mean, you can think of it in terms of plane geometry. Uh, uh, circles are circles in the Poincaré disk. There are also Euclidean circles. You take three points. You can find the circumcircle just using the Euclidean circumcircle. It better be within the Poincaré disk, at the very least. So at the very least, those three points that you're, you're choosing as a candidate for a Delaunay triangle better have a circumdisc. OK, that turns out to be enough. So you do, you do the exact same exercise I just said. You put down points one at a time, and you ask, what is the probability? Or yeah, you, you want to, oops. 
You want a lower bound for this volume. Uh, but you want to work on the event that, that everything has a finite circumdisk. If you do that, instead of having just the uniform, you'll have this epsilon to the k from before, and you get this huge normalizing factor, uh, which is the volume of the ball of radius r. And this is exactly what you need to cancel the entropy from having that many points, ball of radius r to the kth power. Uh, so the real proof is only one step more complicated now because you need to also consider other triangulated shapes. You can't just do a, a line like this. But, but basically, this is what you need to do. Um, so I want to say one thing about why that's true. Um, uh, so, so once you establish it, it really completes the proof. Um, why is it true? So the basic geometry lemma is this one. So you fix this radius that you're going to sample from. And I'll put one of my points to be zero. And I'll take x to be a point on, well, it doesn't really matter where. I can put it on the real line. And then y is chosen uniformly from the ball. So the probability that this area is less than theta and the circumdisk exists is bounded by a constant times theta. Here you have some factor relating the, well, OK, if it's x and y are, x and 0 are right on top of each other, you won't have a big area no matter what. And so it's really theta over this. But then you actually have this extra factor here coming from uh, the volume of the ball of radius r. So this is the claim. And the, the proof is a picture. Behold. So what's going on here? So there's 0. There's x. Um, we're sampling y from a ball of radius r. Where is the ball of radius r? It's not there. Uh, OK, this is an important lesson. The ball of radius r is not important. Um, what is the set of points in the hyperbolic plane whose area with 0x, the triangle 0xy, what is the set of points y so that the area of the triangle 0xy has volume theta? Nice little fact that it is exactly the points on this line coming up. Okay, or well, there's also a symmetric one. Okay, but we'll just work with this one. So all those points have exactly area theta. Um, what are the points y that have a finite circumdisk? Well, that means that you, you have to draw the point through 0, x, and y, and you get a ball. And if you think of moving the point up in, into the upper, well, in the upper half plane here, uh, what you see is that all these points, well, we're, they actually converge. The circles converge. And they converge to this horror disk right here. And so the, the statement is that point y that you pick actually has to land in this horror disk or in that horror disk. So the point y needs to be below this wedge, and it needs to be contained within one of the two horror disks. That has nothing to do with the ball of radius r. So you can make the ball of radius r as big as you want. The area you're calculating is this blue bit and this red bit. So that's, that's your probability. You, you find that area, and then you divide by the volume of the ball of radius r. This is why you get independent control, regardless of the size of the ball. OK. So I want to talk a little bit more about about this. So, so there's, since this was done, we, we were able to get a proof which is much different in flavor, which works in, in d-dimensional hyperbolic space. Um, I think that the truth should be m much more general than that. And I have no idea how to do this. So I said that, that, uh, that many of the, the, the basic statements worked in non-positively curved Riemannian symmetric space. These are all non-amenable. I would guess that the same thing holds for anchored non-amenability. So if you take a non-positively curved Riemannian symmetric space, you put a Poisson process on it, which is invariant, then 
you have positive anchored expansion. And it's, this would be really a spectacular theorem. But the, so far, it's only known partially for even d-dimensional space. Um, second set of questions revolves around boundary convergence. So in the pictures I've shown, you, you can draw this all in the, the, the Poincare disk. If you run random walk on it, it's going to be ballistic. So where does it go? Well, it goes from the origin, it goes out and lands somewhere on the boundary. So you have a harmonic measure. Where on the boundary does it go? So there's a wonderful theorem about lattices. Hope I'm saying it right, that if you put a lattice in hyperbolic space, the, the harmonic measure will have a Hausdorff dimension less than one. And if you do the nearest neighbor random walk. Uh, it comes from the sort of anisotropy of the problem. Because if you go in some directions, you have to go left and right some amount. You go in other directions, you go left and right a different amount. So you get this kind of uh, fractal-like uh, distance distortion. Um, this process is anisotropic, right? I mean, it's a Poisson process. It looks the same going in every direction. However, I still think it's singular for a different reason, that the harmonic measure is singular. Uh, people have told me I'm, I'm stupid for thinking this, so I think it's an even better question. <laughs> uh, is, it, is it singular? Yeah. So, well, if you want to talk to me about it, please come talk to me about it. Uh, so I conjecture no. I mean, yes. Uh, and do I have another slide? No. Okay. So I did want to spend a few minutes saying a, an open problem, but I guess this is the end of the talk, so I'll stop now. Maybe we'll take questions if there are. But. Are there any questions? <laughs> Yes. So, um. Thanks. Uh, what do you think about uh, return probabilities? And this? So, so. Yeah. Uh, do they are they also n to the minus one third in the exponent, or n to the one third in the exponent? Um, I think no. I, I think they're they're probably exponential, just e to the n minus n. But that uh, that should be equivalent to amenability, no? To to non -amenability. non amenability, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so the reason that they're they're the end of one third in the Galton Watson case, which is the only one I really understand, uh, doesn't seem to be possible to me here, because of p pipes and trapping phenomena, which don't really happen, I don't think. That's a good question. Uh, so it would be very interesting if it was n to the one-third. Yeah, so I guess it can't be n, though. That's, that's, that's a good point, yeah. Any other questions? OK, so if not, then, uh, well, let's uh, thank Elliot again.